hearing small business person in my home state of Indiana. My father, uncles have been in small business ownership as well. So I've seen firsthand the hard work and the commitment that it takes to own a business and how important business ownership is to minority communities. So I'm eager to work with you all and this subcommittee to hear your questions and to discuss how we, how we uh, best support minority small businesses. In these tough economic times, minority-owned small businesses have been especially hard hit. According to a study by the SBA's Office of Advocacy, on average, minority-owned firms have lower receipts and fewer employees and are less likely to have access to capital than non-minority-owned firms. Minorities are 32% of the population, but make up 18% of business ownership. Meanwhile, for every dollar earned by a white-owned firm, Pacific Islander-owned firms made about 59 cents, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian-owned firms made about 56 cents, and African-American-owned businesses made 43 cents. And finally, survival rates of minority firms are significantly lower than those of white firms. Knowing this, it's clear that we must do all we can to support minority-owned businesses in a comprehensive way. Certainly, federal procurement is a, is a part of that, but also through increased access to capital and increased opportunities for technical assistance and counseling as well. As you know, Congress set the goal of awarding 23% of all federal contracting dollars to small businesses. Congress also created goals for women-owned businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, businesses in hub zones, and socially and economically disadvantaged businesses known as SDBs, which include many of our minority firms. These goals, especially the SDB goal, reflect the capacity of minority-owned small businesses and help the government to ensure that these companies have the opportunity to compete for and to win federal contracts. We're proud that in fiscal year 2009, 7.5% of contracts, or over $7 billion, went to SDBs. The 7.5% uh, exceeds the statutory goal of 5%. SDBs have also been successful in winning Recovery Act contracts. So far, nearly 12% of Recovery Act contracts, or $3.7 billion, has gone to SDBs. Moreover, SBA has programs in place that expand businesses' capacity, including minority-owned businesses, so they can compete for and win government contracts. And chief among these is the 8A program. The 8A program is a nine-year business development program for socially and economically disadvantaged businesses, the majority of which are minority-owned. Participants receive business development, technical assistance, and the chance to work alongside larger firms in a mentor-protege relationship. 8A has helped thousands of businesses across the country. I'd like to cite a couple of examples. In Jacksonville, Florida, A. Herald & Associates provides training, tech support, and project management for clients across the country. Owner Andy Harold created 24 new jobs after enrolling in the 8A program. In Los Angeles, JNP Construction saw their sales increase tenfold since entering the 8A program. The company recently graduated from the program and has agreed to come back uh, as a mentor for new 8A firms. But of course, despite the success of the 8A program, we have more work to do. Recently, our agency undertook the first ever comprehensive review of the 8A program strengthening the rules to ensure that the benefits of the program flow to the businesses that need them, and we're very close to implementing these recommendations. Furthermore, SBA has made strong, robust oversight a top priority. We're working to root out fraud, waste, and abuse in our certification programs with a three-step process, improving certification, strengthening our monitoring and oversight, and increasing in enforcement. In addition, the President's Task Force on Government Contracting came back with a number of concrete, actionable recommendations to address the challenges and barriers to success for small businesses seeking federal contracts. And many of my colleagues on the, this morning's panel lend, uh, their, lent their expertise to that very important effort. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Director Henson, uh, Associate Administrator Park, Acting Director Oliver, and Director Neal, all of whom were involved uh, in that very important effort. It's clear that this commitment to small business contracting spans the entire federal government. The task force identified three main areas of focus, to develop clearer and more comprehensive policies, provide better trained federal work uh, a, a better trained federal contracting workforce, and to improve and better leverage technology. And this fall, the SBA will be announcing its Advisory Council on Underserved Communities. 
I'm excited to be leading this effort, and our purpose will be working to develop strategies to promote business growth and entrepreneurship in traditionally underserved areas. Finally, minority contractors will be helped by resolving the issue of parity. A current court decision would give hub zone businesses preference above other set-aside programs, potentially redirecting millions of dollars away from 8A businesses. In closing, let me assure you that everyone at SBA is aware of the need to support minority businesses. We are proud of the programs we have in place, but we must work diligently and continue to improve. And I'm looking forward to working with this committee and with Congress as a whole in a partnership to enhance the tools that we provide currently and to continue to, de to develop new ones as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johns. And uh, Ms. Parks, Ms. Park, you may proceed. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. I'm Ji Young Park, Associate Administrator of the Office of Small Business Utilization with the U.S. General Services Administration. Minority business ownership is something I feel strongly about. Several family members, including my father, have owned local small businesses. I have seen how business ownership and hard work can lead to economic independence and prosperity among minority communities and among their broader communities. I look forward to hearing your questions today and discussing how we all can better support minority business success in federal contracting. As Director Hinson referenced with the statistics, minority firms without question will continue to play a pivotal role in our economy. And we at GSA continue to support this ever-growing group of businesses. And we partner closely with the MBDA, SBA, and other agencies to do this. Um, the Honorable Johns mentioned small business and small disadvantaged business goals government-wide. GSA consistently exceeds these goals for our agency. To date, in 2010, we have awarded nearly $1.9 billion to small businesses, which is 28.7% of our eligible contract spending. We have awarded $829 million to small disadvantaged businesses, which represents 12.7% of our contracting so far this year. This achievement illustrates GSA's dedication to creating opportunities for minority businesses. More importantly, these numbers are a testament to the great achievement of minority businesses themselves. In 2009, GSA received $5.85 billion through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to convert federal buildings into high-performing green spaces and to green the federal fleet. This portfolio includes many large capital construction projects that were not best suited for small businesses. Despite this challenge, we are committed to minority businesses at both the prime and subcontract level. To date, GSA has awarded $452 million directly to minority firms of Recovery Act funds. One such recipient is Rios Associates, a Los Angeles-based, Hispanic-owned firm who won $300,000 to develop sustainable landscapes for GSA buildings. OKE Thomas & Associates, an African-American-owned, Missouri-based company, won $16 million for multiple GSA projects across the Midwest, ranging from carpet installation to roof upgrades using Energy Star materials. Finally, Epsilon Systems Solutions, an Asian-American firm in San Diego, won $350,000 to provide technical expertise for various GSA recovery projects. The list goes on. Awards like these across the country are helping minority firms make payroll, grow their business, contribute to the greening of our federal buildings, and create green jobs for the future. The Recovery Act is only one part of GSA's overall portfolio. In a given year, nearly 17% of federal contract dollars flow through GSA. We are fully committed to stewarding these funds to maximize small and minority business opportunity. One of the best ways we do this is through GSA's multiple award schedules program. Currently, 19,000 scheduled contracts are in place, of which nearly 15,000 are held by small businesses. 2,300 are held by small disadvantaged businesses. This fiscal year, as of the end of August, small disadvantaged businesses have received $2.8 billion through the schedules program, or 7.3% of program sales totaling $40 billion. Another way we level the playing field is GSA's government-wide acquisition contract that has been set aside exclusively for participants in SBA's 8A program. This contract is called 8A STARS. Nearly 200 8A firms participate in GSA's STARS, and since 2004, 
these firms have received $2.7 billion in orders. In addition to our contract vehicles, GSA provides a wealth of outreach and education to minority businesses. Last October, GSA launched a mentor protege program to help small and minority firms team, subcontract to other firms, and compete on their own. To date, our mentor protege program has established 40 mentoring relationships, a third of which include small disadvantaged businesses. This program is just one of many resources GSA has to help minority firms. We also host and participate in hundreds of outreach events across the country each year, including those hosted by the SBA and MBDA and other federal agencies. And we also work side by side with procurement teams to help create opportunities for minority business from the inside. In closing, we at GSA have a strong record with minority businesses. We are committed to increasing minority firms' access to contract opportunities and to building their capacity to succeed, while at the same time bringing the most innov innovative ideas and best industry expertise to the government. I'd be happy to answer any questions and provide any other information at the subcommittee's request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Park, for your testimony. Ms. Oliver, you may proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairwoman Watson. Uh, Ranking Member Bill Bray, Mr. Conley, Ms. Chu, it's nice to be here, but I have deadly boring testimony. It's, <laughs> it is all about numbers, so <clears throat> I will really summarize the, the, what the Please numbers uh, tell us, and I will begin with a, di with a digression. Um, last night I had a telephone call from somebody who, in theory, was calling me because he wanted to know something about small business. This is a man in Los Angeles. I found out as I talked to him that the real reason he was calling me beca was because he wanted me, he thought I should take this chance <clears throat> to mention publicly from, you know, uh, many constituents, as I understand it, how much they have appreciated ambassador, as he called her, Ambassador Watson's uh, work. And so <clears throat> I pass that along to you. Um, My brother, was it? I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, he would never come. <laughs> 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 anything like my, <laughs> uh, my testimony, uh, in, in developing testimony, we looked at the numbers in a, a general way and then in more specific ways. And so it's a series of charts. The first chart, uh, charts looked at small disadvantaged businesses that do contracting with the Department of Defense. Uh, and we looked at it over a nine year period. And I am pleased to say that we have consistently, our contracting dollars that go to small dis disadvantaged businesses has consistently increased. And in general, we have increased the percentages. Um, in uh, 2001, we were at 5.6%, which is, is, exceeds the goal. Um, and in 2009, the new 2009 figures show that we are at 6.9%. So we are, I'm so happy to be talking about this area because this is an area where we're doing well. Uh, we also looked at the, the uh, in more detail, at the, um, the numbers from in for the last three years, 2007, 8, and 9. And <clears throat> I am pleased to say again that broken, whether we break it down by 8A companies um, or by the, the 8A company, the small disadvantaged businesses that are not 8A companies, in both cases, the Department of Defense shows an upward trend in, con in dollars contracted in numbers of contracts with small disadvantaged businesses, both categories, uh, <clears throat> uh, and we are very pleased by that. We have also been happy with our Recovery Act numbers. Uh, the Department of Defense received uh, $7.4 billion under the Recovery Act, which actually is not very much for Department of Defense, but the, we have Let me just uh, interrupt you for a moment. Sure. The charts that Ms. Oliver is referring to, I understand, are in your statement on they the table. Are. Yes, ma'am. Great, so that uh, you can pick them up on your way out. Yes. Thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm. uh, with, where Recovery Act is concerned, 
uh, right now, approximately half of our Recovery Act dollars are going to small businesses, and 34.9% of our ARRA dollars are going to small disadvantaged businesses. Now, I'm realistic enough to know that there are going to be some big purchases down the road a piece that are planned and those numbers will go down, but we are very pleased with where our numbers are. Um, <clears throat> finally, um, we took a, a look at the sorts of things that the small businesses and small disadvantaged businesses with whom we contract with, with what they purchase, because we think that might help us in our plans. <laughs> that there are four main areas that small disadvantaged businesses contract with us. Um, manufacturing, construction, professional scientific and technical services, and administration reports. That accounts for 89, almost 90% of all of our small disadvantaged business contracts. Well, there is my quick summary. I am... I have been uh, appreciated being able to come and tell you that Department of Defense is, we're doing very, we're very happy with what we have done with small disadvantaged businesses and through analysis we help to continue on in this upward pattern. Thank you so much and uh, I'm sure there'll be questions and uh, Mr. Connolly, I know that you are concerned about the DOD so uh, we'll get to questions in just a few minutes. You may proceed, Mr. Neal. Good morning, Chairwoman Watson and Ranking Member Bill Bray and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting the U.S. Department of Transportation to discuss our efforts to comply with government-wide contracting requirements for minority-owned businesses. My name is Brandon Neal, and I'm the Director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Under the leadership of Secretary Ray LaHood, DOT has been a strong advocate for ensuring the participation of small businesses and ensuring that opportunities created by our nation's investment are shared by all Americans. DOT small business contracting opportunities are available through our direct federal contracting program and through recipients of DOT, financial assistance via, this, via the Disadvantaged Business Program, DBE program. In fiscal year 2009, DOT received an A scorecard rating from the U.S. Small Business Administration for meeting its direct contracting small business procurement goals. In fiscal year 2009, $752 million was awarded to small and disadvantaged businesses. The DBE program is designed as a vehicle to increase the participation of DBEs in state and local procurement through our Federal Highway Administration, our Federal Transit Administration, and our Federal Aviation Asian administration. These are the three DOT operating administrations involved in the DOT program. The department created a high-level task force to take a look at the DBE program and develop a long and short-term recommendation process to improve the administration of the DBE program. The task force is chaired by yours truly and it's also comprised of the senior leadership of each operating administration. The secretary and the deputy secretary have personally participated in many of the task force meetings. Secretary LaHood sent a letter to each governor and state DOT administrator indicating the department's commitment to work together to provide small and disadvantaged businesses with an opportunity to, to participate in transportation projects. In a May 2010 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, we proposed several important improvements to the DB program. One, accountability for state DOT recipients. Two, adjusting the personal net worth threshold. And three, Improvement with post-award oversight. We anticipate a final issuing within the next few months of the rulemaking. DOT quickly dispersed contracts funded through the Recovery Act, and the projects are still continuing to provide contracting opportunities. Additionally, projects are now in the stage of providing subcontracting opportunities for small businesses. Our most recent data indicates we've awarded $24.9 billion in our contracts, of which $2.08 billion have been awarded to DBEs. Additionally, we implemented a bonding education program in collaboration with the Surety Fidelity Association of America to get small businesses bond ready. Becoming bondable is a major obstacle for many DBEs, and this pilot program aims to address the issue and help those businesses grow by becoming bond ready and to compete for larger contracts. Some examples of our outreach include over 180 outreach activities across this country this past year, the participation in the White House 
Interagency Task Force on Federal Contracting Opportunities for Small Businesses. In March 2010, DOT hosted the inaugural Small Business Summit entitled The Road to Recovery, attended by more than 700 small business leaders from across the country. Plans are currently underway for the second summit in 2011. Our short-term lending program continues to help small businesses gain access to financing. We've implemented a pilot entrepreneurial training and technical assistance women and girls program with Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. This program is a part of a broader effort led by the White House Council on Women and Girls. Last month, Secretary LaHood announced the award of $11.6 million in grants for minority and women-owned businesses to provide federal aid to state DOTs for DBE firms to improve their ability to compete for and fulfill federal highway contracts. As demonstrated in the testimony of the Department and other witnesses on this subject before the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the Department of Justice's compelling interest narrative and the Department's own experience Race-conscious programs like the DBE program continue to be needed to address discrimination and its continuing efforts in transportation contracting. DOT is continuously looking for ways to increase small and minority business contracting. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Mr. Neal. I'd like to start the questioning now, and I'm going to go quickly so I can get to our ranking member, and then I'll get to you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Henson, given that the Minority Business Development Agency now assists minority businesses of all sizes with their efforts to secure financing and other public and private sector contracts, what has your agency discovered uh, regarding the issues confronting minority-owned businesses? Uh, thank you for that question. Certainly we have discovered, as was outlined in the testimony and in our uh, our reports that minority firms suffer tremendously from a lack of access to capital. Um, our, our studies and our research has shown that they struck, they suffer from a lack of access to contracts, uh, and um, you know they suffer from access to new market opportunities. And so those are the three areas where we found that minority-owned firms are and continue to be challenged. Uh, we are basing this hearing around uh, H.R. 4343, and I think you heard the provisions. Uh, how would these programs that are proposed in that legislation affect the MBDA's uh, current operations, and what, if any, types of uh, additional resources would the agency require yes. to implement these programs? Thank you. Yeah. To achieve our current mission right now as it stands and as we are focused, we have adequate resources. These resources would expand our capabilities to go beyond where we are now. For example, we operate 46 business development centers around the country. These types of resources would quite naturally allow us to gain a broader footprint to help more firms grow to size and scale. Uh, but in terms of our current operation, um, our resources are sufficient to maintain the mission that we have now. Could you, if there's another area that seems to be uh, uniquely depressed, how would they go about getting one of the centers that you have around? Well, certainly it's in the, it's in the purview of, of Congress to decide if they want to, a congressperson or a congress in general to decide. Would we have to make that decision, or do you have the authority to make that decision? We do not have the authority to make that decision beyond what is within the context of our budget, for example. Um, well, we, that's what I'm get, really getting to. Can you open a new center if such an area exists and applies to you? Or do you have to come back to Congress? We certainly have the ability because we, these centers are public-private partnerships. And so we, do, we go out and we actually bid these centers out. Um, we have, uh, the centers we have are uh, the number of centers that we can actually have in the marketplace given our resources. Uh, and so yes, it's within our power to expand that footprint but again, we are, uh, in that respect, we are resource constrained. Let, let me give you a case in point. California could be mm -hmm. three states. Central Valley is suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know these are the uh, field workers and so on. Should they want to start a small business to enhance uh, opportunities for jobs other than picking our fruits and vegetables, 
uh, would they come then to your center? And most of these are Hispanic workers and so on. Is your center authorized to start uh, an opportunity there in that area if they applied? Yes, we provide- Within your budget. Well, again, we are within the context of our current resources. Um, we have essentially maxed out on our capability to, to expand our center footprint. Um, what, we, what we are doing is we're continuing to expand job growth by focusing on uh, larger uh, minority-owned and operated firms. Uh, Congressman uh, Bill Bray had an interesting point uh, earlier when he was uh, speaking with uh, uh, Congressman Rush about the, the power of size and scale. Uh, we partner, we work very closely with SBA. Uh, SBA has a tremendous number of, of programs that help firms start businesses um, of different sizes. Our target market is really geared towards, again, because of what we work with on the research side, we're really geared towards providing services to those firms that are a million dollars or more in gross revenue but at the same time, we provide services to all the all for all minority firms of all sizes. Okay, let me yield now to our ranking member. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, let me just say I appreciate the comment, um, Ms. Oliver. I want to thank you uh, for bringing up a comparison between the disadvantage and the small, so we get some. And some people may say, well, fifty percent may sound good, but when sixty percent of jobs are created by small that looks 10% deficient. But in all fairness to you, I have to say, um, I assume though, that the 50% that go to the big guys, are there's many subcontracts that are serving that community, uh, the small guys through the larger contracts. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. And particularly with these funds, because many of them are construction and construction <clears throat> is an area where there are, are mo uh, virtually always lots of subcontracts. It's the way the industry operates. Right, I appreciate it. Ms. Johns, I, your uh, reference, and you made uh, something that we do, I think, too often, and in all fairness to you, it just happens to be that we go down and we talk about the disadvantage numbers. One thing I learned, I did a lot of work in environmental health, and that single um, uh, component models are very, very deficient, and if not illusions, that you have to have multi-faceted uh, uh, models to always make sure you cover the big ones. And I think um, you were pointing out there fairly on that about the, the return that um, businesses get based on um, the, the community or the ethnic background of the owner. Um, did you have with those data too the proportionality between the profit margin and the return that you get based on size and the inherent disadvantage of the little guy competing in the field? I don't have any specific data about that for this morning. Um, Ranking Member Bill Brady would be happy to come back or provide a specific response to any question you may have. What I would like to tell you, though, is that um, the SBA is undertaking a, a rigorous look at size standards. I have, uh, in, even in my short time uh, uh, at the SBA, I have made it uh, a strong priority to meet with minority business owners. In fact, I had uh, roundtables with two um, two sets of uh, 8A business owners just last <coughs> week. One was a national representation, the other was local. And uh, the issue of size standards is something that comes up. Uh, and that is, as companies uh, grow to a certain size and their inability, once once they size out of, so to speak, the, uh, the small business category, uh, but yet not sufficiently large to compete with really large companies, uh, we know that is an issue that we have to, uh, to pay close attention to. And so that uh, a study is underway uh, to do just that. And um, Congressman Bilbray, if I may also just say a word about uh, the notion of coverage and footprint and access to uh, to services to start small businesses. Um, I appreciated Director Henson's reference to the SBA because the agency does have uh, a very um, broad network throughout the country through our resource partners, the small business development centers, um, uh, our our affiliation with SCORE, our women business centers, that in an, a year's time, we touch a little over one million individuals to provide counseling to them. And so uh, that's why partnership is so very important. MBDA has, has its uh, area of expertise. The SBA uh, is, the, is a place where 
a full complement of services, particularly focused on small businesses that we, we uh, strive to, uh, uh, to make available. And again, we are looking at where we can improve our outreach and improve our-, our um, Ms. Johns, I appreciate that. I think that one of the things we got to admit, and uh, in fact, I guess the example totally separate from this was the RTD back in the, the 80s where the big guys, the, everything was grouped together. Mm. The contracts were grew up so huge that there were only a few people could put together the capital to manage that. The American taxpayer was absolutely ripped off because you go out to bid to where only two or three people could bid. Um, but because it was easier for the bureaucracy to manage these huge packages rather than breaking them out into competitive market-based uh, structures because just from inherently it's easier to handle one contract rather than 10 or 100. But the taxpayer and the business, the, the, the small guy, got totally cut out of the system. I want to make sure that we keep that in mind because you can't isolate the disadvantaged business people from the, the impact of you know, our policies on small business. De facto, it's always going to be the minority community gets hit harder when the little guy gets hit, regardless of it. And I think the one thing that isn't talked about enough in, um, in, in polite company is the fact that just because it is a disadvantaged minority owned business doesn't mean that people that do not fall into that ethnic crowd is not benefiting because the employees aren't necessarily in one little group. This is very, the employees is very broad and I don't think we talk enough about that, that a job is a job is a job and that just because the boss happens to fall into one category doesn't mean the general community is not benefiting with real, real viable jobs. My question though is when we get down to this issue of subcontractors, are we open frankly and openly to the fact that they can't, uh, like you pointed out, that they get credit for recruiting those subcontractors but being much more aggressive on that? Is that fair to say? May I comment on that? Yes. Um, what we have done at the SBA is, I believe uh, um, it was referenced earlier, we have a scorecard that um, we utilize to track what federal government agencies are doing in the area of, of small business uh, utilization. And just recently, the whole area of subcontracting was strengthened and more focus is being put there because, as you, as you, as you uh, cite, Congressman Bill Bray, the notion of larger contracts for longer terms as the government is looking to operate more efficiently, we've got to make sure that even in that situation that the focus on small business opportunity is not lost. And competition in the long run is going to save us. But I know I've Indeed. burned up time, but the 900K really sticks out to me. There's 900K being spent on these centers. And my question to you is to give you a chance to defend it. Wouldn't that be better used going directly out to your, your, your target rather than creating this, this structure and this overhead of getting this directly out into out, out into the market and stimulate the private sector rather than building this this infra this public sector infrastructure that's costing um, 900k. When you say, I'm sorry, you, you, uh, 900k. What are you referring? I'm to? talking about um, hiring the, the the development of the business centers and hiring the experts um, uh, consultants. Right. The, uh, the answer to that question, I would, I would respectfully say, is, is no. Those business development centers create the conditions for minority-owned and operated firms to gain access to capital and access to contracts, the two key inputs if you want to grow a company. When you look at our operation, um, our ROI is over 100 times. In other words, for every dollar of taxpayer money that flows into our agency, we create a, over $100 of economic output. Uh, I would argue, sir, that it's the exact reverse. You would want to expand the footprint so you can touch more firms, help these firms grow to size and scale. Uh, and I might add anecdotally that minority-owned firms are twice as likely to export as non-minority-owned firms. Um, this sector screams for, uh, <coughs> for investment and for support. And so I would argue to you that, you know, from where we sit, the, the, the dollars that are committed to these centers are critical to providing the conditions under which these firms can grow. Thank you. And Madam Chair, just for the record, California does not constitute three states. Just <laughs> my county is larger, of San Diego is larger than 20 states, and your county is larger than 40 states. I yield back. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us. Uh, I'd like now to yield to Mr. Connolly. I thank the Chair. And before my time starts counting I, on a point of personal privilege, if I may just say, uh, this may be one of your last hearings to chair. Uh, 
Congresswoman Watson, and I just want to say personally, uh, I've really appreciated your friendship and the civility and grace and thoughtfulness with which uh, you comport yourself and bring to every debate and every issue is going to be something sorely missed. Thank, Thank you. you for your Thank service. You. <clears throat> um, let me start, if I may, as uh, the chair uh, uh, anticipated, Ms. Oliver. Uh, and, and by the way, is there somebody from Pentagon Government Relations here with you? Then you will. I don't know. Okay, good. So I hope you take this back. Um, you know, I, I, I want to first of all thank you for your testimony and thanks for summarizing it and admitting a lot of it would have otherwise been boring. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a refreshing uh, uh, change. And none of this is meant personally, but I want since you're here and you're from the Pentagon, uh, as you know, Secretary Gates announced a pullback of 10% of all outside Pentagon contracts for three years, 10% a year for three years. The Virginia delegation was recently briefed by Pentagon folks, uh, and there was not a shred, not a scintilla of evidence to justify such an announcement. There was no analysis. There were no programs or priorities identified. It was just a number pulled out of a hat. And for this member of Congress, and I think increasingly for colleagues on both sides of the aisle, that's not acceptable. And one of the concerns I've got, uh, and by the way, this subcommittee has asked the Pentagon to testify on September 29th. I hope government relations takes it back. You know, you, if you want to duck it, some of us will call it out for precisely that. But the concern I've got, Ms. Oliver, is, and I wonder, I want you to have a chance to comment, when you set an arbitrary goal like that, and what that means is people in the bureaucracy have to scramble to meet it on a date certain, 10%, oh my God. So what happens? Well, you're gonna, hit the, you're gonna take the low-hanging fruit. What's the easiest to pull back from outside contracting to meet that goal? And it ain't the big guys. They've got big law firms, they can litigate, they can appeal, they know how to work the system, and there are lots of other big contracts at stake, you know, even the Pentagon may not want to upset. I think the most, the earliest victims of such an arbitrary 10% pullback will be small and minority-owned businesses. It will be businesses owned by uh, minorities, women, and disabled veterans especially. And I wonder, number one, has your office at all been involved in any of the discussions about this incredible decision when we think about the money and the number of contracts potentially affected and have you done any analysis of the potential impact and how to guard against that negative impact on all of the wonderful statistics you rightfully uh, uh, and pridefully shared with us this morning? I would be so happy if you could tell me how to, how to find those statistics. Yes, we have been, the Department of Defense has been asking itself internally, how, how will we become more efficient without, and particularly without harming small businesses? Um, we are aware of the problem, and I personally would so welcome any um, insight you might be able to give about how to quantify it. Uh, I want to be real clear about your testimony. Are you testifying here that you were consulted before the announcement of a 10% pullback, 10% a year for three years, and that the concern was expressed to you, we want, of course, to make sure that we shield or protect or there's not some disproportionate negative impact on small and minority-owned businesses? No, I am not testifying that. That's what I thought. Um, do you look, have you been invited to any discussions moving forward to the future to talk about the implementation of such a sweeping goal? Yes, I have been. Are you aware of the fact that the Pentagon has been invited by this subcommittee to come and explain that goal and how it would be implemented? Mm, I know. <laughs> I'm not holding you. I, I understand you're not the spokesperson for the Pentagon, but unfortunately for you, you're here. Uh, this happens all the time. And even though we loved your testimony, we want to send you back with a message. 
because this is very serious business and it doesn't just affect my district or my state. It's going to affect Mr. Bilbray's. It's going to affect Diane Watson's. It's going to affect Judy Chu's. Uh, there are contractors all over the country, especially for the Pentagon. Uh, and especially, I worry that one of the unintended consequences, it surely is not an uh, intended consequence, is the very people you get paid to try to help and the very firms you get paid to try to uh, uh, integrate into the opportunities of federal contracting will be hurt the first and the most. And that's the message I'd like you to take back to the Pentagon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you so much for your concern. And uh, we are planning to hold a uh, private confidential hearing and uh, for you to raise those questions and get answers. Uh, we did not want to subpoena anyone from DOD uh, at this hearing, but I think you can uh, get the kind of information you need. We all represent constituencies that will be sorely affected. I mean, they are now. And so that's one of the reasons why we're having this hearing. And uh, in order to save the jobs, particularly those small firms and minority firms that uh, are really impacted uh, greatly in this current economy, uh, we would just like to know what the thinking was that went in. So we're going to have a meeting. We hope to get some direct answers. Uh, with that, let me yield to Ms. Chu. Thank you so much. Uh Madam Chair, uh, I certainly embrace uh, Congressmember uh, Rush's uh, bill, uh, H.R. 4343, uh, and uh, certainly uh, think that it's so important to improve the outreach of um, uh, outreach to minority contractors for federal contracts. Um, and uh, I am certainly alarmed that uh, minority businesses make up 20 percent of all businesses, yet are lagging with regard to federal contracts. Um, and uh, I would like to direct uh, this question to Mr. Hinson. Uh, as, uh, as the chair of the Economic Development Task Force uh, for the Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus, I've been contacted by several uh, Asian Pacific Islander uh, groups, the Asian Pacific Islander Small Business Program, the Pacific Asian Consortium and Employment, the Search to Involve P Filipino Americans, and the Asian Business Association, as well as the Asian Pacific Revolving Loan Fund. And um, they are very, very anxious to, to participate in MBDA and to partake of the technical assistance um, that uh, is inherent in it. Um, and I was wondering what kind of outreach you would be doing to the API uh, community other than attending conferences or participating in roundtables. What kind of technical assistance is there to make these businesses actually succeed? Mm -hmm. I thank you for that question. and. and the, the API communi community is a critical community in this country. Um, in fact, the API community produces um, 500 billion of the one trillion in gross receipts uh, that the entire minority business community generates. Um, certainly, we have this community is critical to MBDA and we continue to provide outreach and support to this community. Um, we have found that from, a, from an overall business standpoint, around 20% of our business activity is with AAPI companies. Um, those companies and those individuals who are interested in participating have access to our centers, just like uh, any other company does. We continue to provide outreach um, to the various members of the community. Um, in fact, um, I would say that at your prodding, which uh, I very much appreciate, uh, with our new website, we actually have bilingual capability. So the various members of the AAPI community who don't have English as their first language have the ability to access the information that MBDA provides in the language of their choice. Uh, and so we continue to outreach this community. We are aggressive about it. It's important to the administration uh, that this community continue to receive support and service, uh, and we continue to outreach uh, and, and, and support this community. Well, I appreciate uh, your um, translation of uh, services on the website. And in fact, I wanted to follow that up with um, the question about uh, linguistically appropriate outreach. Uh, and, uh, and I am concerned both for uh, the Hispanic community as well as for the API community, where you do indeed have many, many high-end businesses where uh, people may be primarily 
proficient in another language. And so I am wondering um, what kind of um, incorporation in the grant program is there about linguistically appropriate services. Right. I just want to make sure that those centers uh, do indeed have the capability to address the linguistic needs of our communities. And, and again, I thank you for that question. Um, some of our centers certainly do have people that work in those centers that speak multiple languages. Uh, our centers are in high dense communities um, where you have a lot of businesses, we have a lot of uh, languages being spoken and, and, and you know as well as anyone that there is no one language that represents the AAPI community. There are quite a number of languages. Uh, I won't sit here and say that on the ground we have the ability, uh, we have the, the, the people that can actually speak each one of the individual languages. I can say that um, for our experience has been for the businesses that we serve uh, that they're very comfortable speaking English uh, in their business transactions. I will tell you that many of them participate uh, in our B2Bs. In fact, we partnered with SBA and DOT, as I mentioned, uh, for the B2B uh, event at our MedWeek uh, conference, and there were quite a number of AAPI companies that took advantage of the access to the $300 billion of contract opportunities that we provided. Uh, and so I, I, I understand your point, and I appreciate that point, and we'll continue to do uh, as much as we can do to make sure we meet the language requirements of the community. In fact, I did write a letter asking for a legal p opinion on including linguistic and culturally appropriate services in the new round of federal funding opportunities to operate MBD's, MBDA centers. Can you tell me what the status is of this legal opinion? Uh, I cannot tell you now. I'll certainly get back to it with an answer to that question. I will tell you that, as I indicated earlier, that all the centers are public-private partnerships. Uh, there's open bidding. Uh, we're in the process of, of going out with the new uh, FFO to open up the bidding for these centers and any, anybody who is interested in bidding, anybody from the AAPI community who wants to bid, they have the right uh, to bid and they will be reviewed in competition with all the other bidders for those particular centers. That, that is great. I just would hope that uh, there'd be some encouragement for those bidders um, and especially those who might have linguistically appropriate uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, to conclude this panel, I'd like to go to Mr. Neal. And if you can answer very quickly, I'm going to put two questions in one. Uh, DOT has received a considerable uh, number of funds, stimulus funds. And how much of these dollars have gone uh, to uh, DBE firms, and do you believe discrimination continues to be a problem in the transportation industry? We're getting some feedback, and uh, there seems to be some contractors out there that are contacting us that they feel that they've been treated unfairly. So can you respond? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, approximately in our, under our Federal Highway Administration for recovery dollars, $1.7 billion uh, was committed to DBEs out of $24.5 billion. Under our FTA Federal Transit Administration, we had 13 percent go to DBEs and $2.3 billion funded uh, and $290 million was, were awarded excuse me, to DBEs. And under our FAA Administration, the Federal Aviation Administration. Can I just stop you there? Sure. Would you give us those statistics in writing Absolutely. to our committee. Absolutely. I'd like to circulate.